for your CNA world. This is Miss Patty with For Your CNA. Um, thanks for joining me today. It is Thursday, uh, September 30th at 3 p.m. And as always, I'm here to do my live question and answer session Thursdays at 3. So while I wait for you guys to join in, and when you get in, make sure that you uh, let me know in the chat. Hello, Monique. Thanks for joining us today. Awesome. So if you guys have got any questions, make sure you put them in the chat um, until everybody gets in and has a chance to say hi. Um, I want to talk to you about two comments that I got this week on our YouTube channel. So the first one is Lords asked, and this was on assisting a resident with a bedpan. So that's the skill she was watching. And Lords asked, what if the client is paralyzed, 100% paralyzed? So I want to answer this um, because this kind of comes up quite a bit, comes up in my classroom training, comes up on uh, comments on my YouTube videos. So I want to talk about this just a little bit. The first thing that I need to explain is that if a patient is 100% paralyzed, they're not going to be using a bedpan because if they're 100% paralyzed, they would have no ability to control their urine or feces. That's part of that paralyzation process. So somebody that is 100% paralyzed is going to be incontinent because that means that the nerves that control the valves that hold the bladder shut or the rectum shut, those nerves are not functioning. They're not connecting to the brain. So incontinence is what you would have. So in that case, you wouldn't have a bedpan. Okay. So that's the first thing. So bedpan would not be appropriate for somebody that is a hundred percent paralyzed. Now, the second part of my answer is even if, Okay, if you have a patient that has limited mobility, can't get out of bed, can't raise their hips, can't roll over on their own, and they're using a bedpan, um, that would have to be decided by the nurse. Okay, so if you remember, if you go back to my very, very, very beginning, I explain, if you watch the care plan video, I explain that CNAs don't figure out what patients need. That's not our job. Our job is to follow the care plan. So a nurse goes in, does a head to toe assessment, figures out how we're going to take care of the patient, writes all that down, all those instructions down, and we call that a care plan. And the CNA's job is to follow the care plan. So if you've got a patient that can't lift their hips, can't roll to the side, is totally immobile, um, then we may have to come up with another accommodation. Now, I can't give you that accommodation because we're talking about one of a million hypothetical patients. So I can't give you one answer that's going to fit every single scenario you can come up with. The answer has to be specific to that patient, the one you're working on right now. And anything that, you know, if I, if I give you a hypothetical, so let's say that we've got uh, a dementia patient who is immobile in bed and they're still using a bedpan, um, then I would say, you know, this patient can't raise their hips. So um, when you use the bedpan, you're going to have to roll them on their side. And that would be in the care plan. So the care plan is going to give you that specific instruction for that particular patient. Um, and it's not something that you can just kind of guess. Because let's say same patient, dementia patient, immobile, laying in bed, can't move on their own, but they've got an incision on one of their hips. Well, if I say you've got to roll them on their side and they've got an incision on that side, that may not be the right answer. It may be that they always have to be rolled onto their left side or that, um, you know, we need two people to roll them to keep their, their um, body mechanics straight. It's called log rolling. Um, so every, I, I can't give you one answer that's going to cover absolutely everything because every patient is going to have to have a different accommodation. Um, and that's where that care plan comes in. So I hope that helps. 
um, Lourdes. Um, I know that you had some questions about how do you, you know, assist a patient who is a hunt because Lourdes is actively working with a patient who is paralyzed. But that information that you're seeking can't come from a YouTube video. It's got to come from the nurse that's taking care of that patient that can give you the specific information about that patient and their accommodations. So I think that you're looking in the wrong place for the answers that you need. So um, my suggestion to you is to go back to the nurse that's in charge of that person's care and ask them these very specific questions so that you can make sure that you're giving the best possible care to that patient. I hope that helps. Now, my second question. Hi, Gloria. Thanks for joining me. The second question that came up in um, the uh, comments as I was reading through them today came from Mimi Lulut. And um, Mimi is having a tr having a hard time with the written test. They're passing the skills, but they're having a hard time with the written test and asked for specific um, interventions that they can take to uh, be able to pass the written test. And unfortunately, I'm only here for about 30 minutes once a week. So I can't teach an entire class everything you need to know about passing the written test in this short time that I have. Um, so I would suggest that you go watch the videos that I have on my website. Uh, my online class will help you with that. The practice test that I have on my website for free will help you with that. But there's some very specific things I want you to pay attention to when you're preparing for the written test. And there's five things that you need to be absolutely sure that you truly understand to take the written test and be successful. The first is patient rights. And this trips people up all the time. OK, so you're not alone. Um, unfortunately, healthcare workers, a lot of times they go into it thinking that and I don't know where they get this, but they think that patients have to do what we tell them to do. No, they don't. Patients never have to do what a healthcare worker tells them to do. That is, that can't be you couldn't get any further from the truth. The only people that have the right to force you to do something that you don't want to do are cops, very limited, and judges. That's it. That's it. So just because you're in a nursing home doesn't mean that you don't have the right to go out and smoke. If you want to go outside and smoke, you can smoke. Even if you're diabetic, it doesn't mean that you can't eat that bag of M&Ms. If you want to eat the bag of M&Ms, that is your right as an adult in a free country Patients have rights. You don't always make the right decision for yourself every day. You don't. Um, you know, when you go through McDonald's, you're not getting a tall glass of ice water and a salad with low fat dressing. You're getting the French fries because it tastes good. You're getting the Coke because you want the bubbles, right? You're making decisions for yourself every day that may not be the most healthy or the most um, advantageous decision that you could make. So, But you have the right to make those decisions. I have the right to go spend money at big lots that I don't really need to be spending. There's nobody there that's restricting my um, choices. That's up to me, right? So we all have rights. Unfortunately, in healthcare, for some reason, we think that once a patient gets plopped down into a medical facility, that their rights just kind of like magically disappear. They don't. Patients have the right to make choices, even bad choices. They have the right to do that. Now, we don't let people make bad choices that will impact other people in the facility that we're there to keep uh, safe. But if your patient wants to go outside and smoke, that is their right to do so, unless the facility is a no smoking facility. That's a whole different ballgame. What I'm talking to you about right now is patient rights. OK, and you have to know that for the test, because there's going to be a lot of questions on the state exam. So if any of the answers treats a adult patient like a child, it's not the right answer. 
So that's the first thing you, that you need to understand is patient rights. The second thing that you need to understand is safety. Now, safety is both the patient's safety and it's also your safety. So there's going to be safety questions on the state exam. So you need to have a good grasp of both of those, patient safety and your safety. And that kind of leads into the third one, which is infection control. You need to understand infection control. And healthcare workers get this wrong a lot because a lot of times healthcare workers think that those gloves are there to protect them, right? I don't want to touch patients. They have cooties. They have ooey gooey. I'm not touching them. I want gloves for absolutely everything. I get it. But the problem is that when you wear gloves for absolutely everything, you stop paying attention to what those gloves are touching and you cross contaminate all over the patient environment and probably onto the patient themselves. And because you're not paying attention, you may even cross contaminate onto yourself. So you need to have a very good, clear understanding of infection control principles. Now, the fourth thing that you want to pay attention to is for the written part of the state exam is knowing your role. OK, so this is what does a CNA do? And this kind of feeds into where I started my conversation today in that um, we always follow the care plan. OK, so that's our role. Our role is not to make decisions. So if, if one of the answers is you making a decision, it's not that that's not your role. You do not do that. So as a CNA, we follow the care plan. We perform the tasks according to the principles. So the rules that we have to follow, like washing rules or shoe rules or linen rules or privacy blanket rules or barrier rules or glove rules. Follow the principles, right? So principles are going to guide performance. So care plan, principles guide performance. And then you need to know um, kind of uh, it kind of leads into the next one, which is normal and abnormal. You have to know what's normal and you have to be able to recognize abnormal because part of your role is to report all abnormals to the nurse. So anything that you observe, if it makes you go, huh, that's a little weird, you need to be letting the nurse know about that. You don't just go, huh, that's a little weird, and then go off about your day. If, if you noted something, the nurse needs to know about it, and that's part of your role. So you knowing normals and abnormals is part of it. OK, you, you need to, to understand normal vital signs. You have to understand that dry skin in the elderly is normal, that um, since they lose that subcutaneous fat under their skin, uh, older people often feel cold. Um, you, you have to know those normals. Now, if you can master all five of those things, then you'll do fine on the state exam. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, I can't give you all of the information you need to pass the written test in the little 30 minute time frame that I have here. So I hope that helps. Um, let's see, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for joining. Uh, Carmel says, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, Amy says, tell Mimi to try, try Quizlet for CNA Prometric questions. That's a great option. Um, Quizlet has a lot of questions on there. The only thing that I'm going to say about that is to be careful, okay? Um, and I've seen this on other websites, uh, and I've seen it on YouTube as well. Some of YouTube has um, practice questions on YouTube, written questions. And the problem is that those aren't a true indicator of the types of questions you're going to have on Prometrics exam. A lot of the questions that you see that are kind of out there in the the CNA community um, far exceed what you need to know as a CNA. So if you're, you know, looking up questions and it asks you, um, you know, what is the most common bacteria found in a urinary culture? That's not something that a CNA needs to know. 
It's not going to be on the test. It's not relevant to your job description. And if you spend all your time trying to run over here and look up that answer thinking, oh my gosh, I need to know this for the state exam, then you're losing focus on the things that you will be tested on. So be careful about the um, types of questions that you're reviewing for the state exam because they may totally mislead you on what's actually on the state exam. Um, so Quizlet can be a great, a, a fantastic resource for you. But remember, those questions are written by students, you know, other students and maybe some instructors that maybe don't have the complete knowledge of what types of questions you'd see on the state exam. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, we've got a, a practice test on our website on um, foryourcna.com that's very, very similar to the state exam. And uh, it doesn't really go outside of your scope of practice. So that would be another good resource for you. Jennifer has a question. So how come long-term care facilities have a rehab side for those recovering from strokes, but they also have a rehab unit at the hospital? What's the difference? Oh, that's a great question. So in order to understand this, you have to think about billing, okay? Because it's all tied to the money. So in a hospital, hospitals are expensive. Um, you know, an average hospital stay is going to cost you right around $300 a day, maybe a little more, depending on the types of services that you need. It's expensive. Now, insurance companies don't want to pay that. That's like, that's really pricey. So the goal is to get people out of the hospital as soon as possible. And if somebody needs therapy, but not necessarily high level nursing assessments and monitoring, then they can be transferred to a rehab center. Now, rehab centers are going to charge a little bit less. So it's a savings for uh, the insurance company to pay, which in this case is mostly Medicare. So there's a um, benefit to getting people out of the hospital and into rehabs. There's a financial benefit for that as soon as possible. But we also have to think about space, okay? So in a hospital, there's only so many beds to go around. We can't just like add on, you know, when we have a whole bunch of people coming in that, you know, we need to care for. So there's only so many beds. If we have those beds taken up by people who are otherwise pretty stable, they just need some therapy and maybe some medications, maybe a dressing change, but those are all very routine. Then they really don't need to be at the hospital to receive that therapy. We can transfer them out to a more stable um, environment. Now, if we have somebody who is not stable, who has cardiac issues, who has fluid dynamic issues, who has oxygenation issues, who is, um, you know, constantly having episodes where they're doing well and then crashing and they're not stable. Now, that person, even though they may still need therapy, needs to be in a location where they can get more intensive monitoring, assessments, and interventions. So that setting in the hospital would be appropriate for that person. So it has to do with funding, it has to do with space, but it also has to do with the stability level of the patient. I hope that helps you. Antoinette says, good afternoon. Hi, Antoinette. Denise, hi, Miss Patty. So glad I caught you live. You're doing an amazing job. Oh, thank you, Denise. That's awesome. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Uh, Colleen says, hi, Miss Patty. I'm watching your videos and eagerly waiting for my date for testing. Oh, that's so exciting, Colleen. We're going to keep our fingers crossed for you and uh, make sure that you ask questions. If you have any, we're here for you and we're going to send out really good vibes for you for testing. Blue. Hi, Blue. Thanks for coming. Uh, read test questions slow. Okay, so Blue's got some advice. Read the test questions slowly. Wording trips people up, and you're absolutely right on that. Um, example, the test will say give two grams two times a day, and one answer uh, will be give four ounces a day, not four grams. 
Okay, Blue, um, those are, you're right. Wording does trip people up. But unfortunately, this isn't something what that what you're saying there isn't something that would be on the state exam for a CNA because we don't do medications. We don't do anything like that. Um, but wording can trip you up for sure. So read the question very, very carefully um, and make sure that the answer that you're choosing meets the definition of the question itself because wording can trip you up. Um, let's see here. Uh, Lisa says, I failed my test. Oh no, Lisa. I'm so sorry to hear that. Do you have, if, if there's anything that we can help you with, make sure you type it in for me. Let me know where you struggled and maybe we can give you some, um, direction and some tips to help you on your next one. Uh, Callister says, hi, hi, Callister. Blue says, in some states like mine, we state prometric lists possible tested skills and possible written questions to help one study. Yes. Or Washington State. Okay. So, yes, Prometric has a practice test on their website, but they charge $10 for it. Um, kind of keep that in mind. They're making money off of it. <laughs> um so, but yes, they, they do uh, publish practice questions as well. Um, I, I, I'm going to reserve judgment on that. <laughs> I, I, that's a, for me, that's a conflict of interest. Um, you should not be producing test preparation materials for the test that you are going to administer. Um, so that, for me, that's a bit of a conflict of interest. Uh, let's see here. Blue says, and so, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Jennifer says to Leland, I failed mine twice, then finally passed on my third. You'll get it. And yes, we, um, we definitely want you to keep going, keep trying. You will get it. Let's see here. Um, Blue says a person may be transferred to a hospital rehab while waiting placement into a separate rehab center that bets best fits their needs as well. Yes, that's true. Those rehab centers in the hospital can be used for a variety of, of things. Um, and uh, right now, unfortunately, a lot of our rehab centers are full. It's a space thing. You know, there, there's only so many beds to go around. So until they're able to find appropriate placement, you may end up in a rehab section of a hospital. That is, a, that is possible. Now, there are some hospitals, and, and we have to understand that every place is a little bit different, right? So there are some hospitals that are um, all acute care. So it, it's like what we think of as a traditional hospital. And then there's some hospitals that have separate divisions within the hospital system itself. So the hot, you have your acute care hospital. You also have a rehab section. You have a mental health section. You have a um, outpatient section. You have a hospice section. So that would be like an all-inclusive campus where you have one hospital, but you have different sections for different things. Um, and then you've got like um, here in Florida, one of the big new trends is standalone emergency rooms. So, that, you know, an emergency room we think of as being part of a hospital. That way, if, if you're sick enough, then you get transferred upstairs and, you know, now you're admitted to the hospital. Well, they started creating these standalone emergency rooms. Now, that's different from a walk-in clinic, okay? Walk-in clinics are not for really severe emergent. They're for little things, things that, that you know, cuts, uh, colds, um, burns, things like that, Th things that are, are relatively minor in issue. An emergency room should be used for life-threatening situations. So serious motor vehicle accidents, um, multiple fractures, heart attacks, strokes, things that you require high-level care for. And they're actually building standalone emergency rooms in, in different communities to help um, reduce the stress on the big hospitals, but it also provides a convenient place to get higher level type of care. So 
every community is going to be set up a little bit different. The um, hospital systems here in Florida are a little bit different than those that you would find in, let's say, South Carolina. Um, and those might be a little bit different than what you would find in Iowa. So every community is going to is is set up differently, has different community needs, and the hospitals in that area would be um, configured a little bit differently based on the needs of, of that particular setting. I hope that helps. Uh, Jennifer says, I had the same evaluator for my first and third test, and she was probably like, oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> That's good, Jennifer. Um, yeah, the, the evaluators do tend to rotate across several different um, testing centers. So it is possible that you'll get the same one. It's also possible you'd get a different one. Uh, Gilbania says, good afternoon. Hi. Hi, Marley. Thanks for joining us. And Jennifer says, what does the word prometric mean? Oh, that's a great question. I honestly don't have um, an answer for that. That's just the company name. Now, there is, you know, if you break down the word in Latin, um, it kind of means a positive measurement. A metric is a measurement. Uh, pro would be... Um, you know, like you're pro something. Um, but that pro could also mean professional level. So I, I'm not real sure where, whether they're um, utilizing, you know, the, the Latin terms or it's just their company name. I'm not sure what they, um, how they, they formed it. Uh, Jennifer says, when I kept on failing or what I kept on failing was a fluid intake cups but I got 100% on it on my third try. In Oregon, they'll retest you on, on a skill that you failed. Oh, that's good to know. Um, yeah, it, fluid intake can be um, a little bit challenging. Basically, in order to get the cc's, you take the ounces and you multiply that by 30. So if you have an eight ounce cup, so, well, let's just take my cup here. So I've got my cup. This is a 24 ounce cup, okay? So if I drank all of that water, and I needed to know how many cc's I drank because everything in medicine is computed using cc's or mls. That It's the same thing, two different names, same thing, cc's or ml. We would have to multiply 24 ounces times 30 cc's. So if you did that really quickly, so 24 times 30, well, 25 times 30 would give us 750. This is 24, so we have to subtract 30 off of that. So that would be 720 cc's, okay? Um, and that can be a little bit tricky, but um, you do need to have a, a good idea of how to do intake and output measurements because it's a really, really big aspect of CNA um, job requirements. Let's see here. Lisa says, where can I find the state exam questions? Well, Lisa, they're not actually going to give you the actual state exam questions anywhere. That's a violation of um, what we call test integrity. We have to make sure that the test questions are secure. Now, that's further complicated by the fact that there are multiple versions of the test at any given time. So if there are eight people in a testing room testing, there are three or four versions of the test that they're all taking. So they're not taking the exact same test with the exact same questions. There's multiple versions. And then those are switched out at regular intervals, like every six weeks or every eight weeks. Um, so that those test questions um, remain under security, basically. So you can't find the exact test questions anywhere. And you shouldn't. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the patient, right? So if we're thinking about grandma in a rehab somewhere, and grandma needs caregivers. They need you as a CNA to take care of them. Well, we don't want grandma to have a CNA 
that was able to see all of the questions before the test <laughs> and then, you know, answer those questions because now we don't know if that CNA is really, truly knowledgeable enough to take care of grandma at the rehab. So there's nowhere that you can go to see the actual test questions, um, but there's lots of places that have uh, practice tests. And um, I mean, for your CNA, we have them. We have practice tests. We have them in our book, uh, that book right there. Oops, that book right there. Uh, we have them in our book. We have them on our website. And if you take our, our online CNA test prep course, I've got, I don't know, something like a thousand questions in there. It's, a, it's an incredible amount of questions. So they're all there for you, um, but they're not the questions on the state exam. They're designed to make sure that you know the information that you'll need to be able to pass the questions that the exam gives you. I hope that helps. Katie. Hi, Katie. Katie J says, good afternoon. How long can I wait to take the state board exam? I'm in New York, recently finished my CNA program, but I feel like I'm not quite ready for the exam. All right, Katie. Um, the answer to that is you need to contact your school. Um, and I, I hate to push you back on them, but they're the only ones that can help you with this. In most places, you have to take the state exam within six months of graduating from your program. Some places it's 12 months, but most are six months. And there's a very complex answer as to why that I'm not really going to get into. It's a lot of legal stuff and it'll bore you. But you need to contact your school, wherever you graduated from, whoever is making you eligible to test and find out how they schedule the state exam. In some places, the individual has to schedule their own exam. So you would call up Promet or, you know, go onto Prometric's website. You'll fill out the form. They will check with your school to say, hey, did Katie J finish the program? Is she eligible to test? Yes. OK, we'll go ahead and schedule her. Other places, the school themselves has to register you. So they get all of the student information, they bundle it up, and they send it to Prometric and say, these 12 students are eligible to test. So I don't know how your school is set up, so you'll need to contact the school itself to find out that information. But I will tell you, don't wait too terribly long, because I know you don't feel comfortable, I know you don't feel ready, and you never will. That's the really sad part about this, is you're never going to feel completely competent to go test. You, you just won't. So you kind of have to force yourself here to take that step of faith to go ahead and register for the test and take it. Um, and you'll feel much better after you take it. Whether you pass or not, you'll still feel better after you take it. Because if you pass, you're a CNA. Congratulations. You can go out and get a job, start making money, taking care of grandma. <laughs> But if you don't pass, at least all of that unknown, how is the test administered? What kind of questions am I going to get? Um, how am I going to do on the skills? What is the process like? All of those questions will be answered for you. So the next time you go in, you've got a much better understanding of the actual testing process. I hope that helps. But don't don't put it off too terribly long. You should have, you really honestly, what I tell my students is you should be testing within two to three weeks of graduation. That allows you enough time to practice the skills. It puts enough pressure on you that you actually do. Because it's really easy to put off practicing. It really is. You know, dishes need to be done. I'm going to watch this episode on Netflix or I've got to fold laundry or my kid has a school project coming up or I don't have transportation. Or, I mean, there's a million reasons that you will put off practicing. But if you know you've got a test date three weeks from now, you'll make it a priority. You will practice. So don't put it off too terribly long. If you wait any more than three or four weeks, you'll forget what you learned in class. You just will. There's too much going on in the world. Too much stuff that's competing for your brain cells and your memory banks. So if you're waiting a while, you're not going to be successful just because simply you have forgotten what you've learned. I hope that helps. 
Jennifer says the math is just nerve wracking when people are watching you and you're being timed. Yeah, that's true. Very true. Crystal says, hi, Miss Patty. I missed some of your Thursday sessions. What was the topic on? Oh, um, well, Crystal, I unfortunately can't answer that because I've done like, I don't know, 25 of these. So I've talked about a million different things. If you go onto my YouTube channel, so youtube.com slash for your CNA, go onto my YouTube channel. And um, I have playlists set up. So if you click on the one that says live, live sessions, all of them are there and you can kind of go through them and see what, you know, what we've talked about. But we've talked about everything. We have talked about the differences between CNA1 and CNA2 and PCTs and PCAs and all of that. We've talked about different places to work. We've talked about different work environments and, and how your personality is going to affect them. We've talked about um, testing. We've talked about uh, renewal. We've talked about a ton of stuff. And I love it because you guys come up with some really, really good questions. Um, let's see here. Lisa says, thanks. Some Y girl, I think it's some Y girl, uh, says, why do you think the CNA testing stuff is so rigorous when we know when we're actually employed, it's nothing like the class. Ooh. Okay. So let me talk about this really quickly. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to end on this one because this is, this is something that I'm very, very concerned about. In fact, I'm going to be speaking in Cincinnati at the end of next month on this very topic because CNA work should not be completely different from CNA training. They should not be two separate things. And I think we're setting our students up for failure I think that we're doing our workforce a disservice. And I think that ultimately the patients are suffering from this. So CNA training, if done properly, should not be completely different than workplace. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you've got an instructor that doesn't truly understand um testing processes and what's required in the workplace, your instructor may start to focus on things that don't truly reflect what you need to know. And I see this a lot. A lot of the instructors out there are trying to create many nurses rather than educating CNAs. Now, you would think that that sounds okay, but it's not. Because CNAs cannot engage in critical thinking. In fact, the state statutes, all of them, clearly say that CNAs cannot conduct any activity that requires decision making, judgment, um, deci uh, you know, deciding whether something is right or not, um, deciding what skills need to be done. That is not the function of a CNA. And uh, there's a lot of instructors out there that start to look back on their nursing education, early nursing education, and they use that as kind of a springboard for developing their own lesson plans. But that is not what a CNA is, and that is not what a CNA does. Now, when I first started teaching, I actually fell into this trap. I looked at all of the curriculum, all the, the um, what the state said a CNA program had to encompass, and I kind of looked at the test a little bit, and okay, well, this is what they're testing on. These are the skills. And then I tried to, as a nurse, kind of bridge those two, and I focused on body systems, you know, explaining, you know, kidneys and bladder and how a UTI occurs and how we know that there's a UTI and how we test for a UTI, all this stuff that doesn't impact CNAs at all. So I filled their head full of mini nurse stuff, not CNA stuff. And it wasn't until I realized when I started to really dive into the test 
when I started to dissect the test and that led me to the state statutes and the administrative code. And that led me to best nursing practices. And I really, I mean, when, when I tell you I researched this, if you could see my bookshelf that has everything on it, I mean, I researched this. And I realized that um, we're not preparing our CNAs properly, that you know we're, we're giving them information that they don't need. And that unfortunately leads to, to problems like what Lisa is saying, where she's not being able to, um, or, or um, Mimi said, where she's not able to pass the written test. And it's primarily because not because she doesn't have the right information, it's because her head is full of the wrong information. So what you're asking is very, very good. It's, it's, it's right on, on track. I mean, why does a CNA program out there focus on a lot of stuff that we don't use as a CNA in the workplace? So you're absolutely right, and they shouldn't. So my mission I'm here supporting you as students because that's my first love. But my mission is to help instructors learn how to refine their teaching techniques so that when our students are, are in the classroom, we're teaching them things that are relevant to not just the test, but also the workplace. Because there's nothing worse than getting a student teaching them what we think they need to know about the test. They go take the test and they pass. Yay. Great job. But then they get out of the workplace and they're like, whoa, what the heck? This is not what I learned in school. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And they end up leaving healthcare. Now, ultimately, we didn't help anybody. We did not help anybody because the student is not meeting their goals. They're not able to work in healthcare. They're not able to learn, earn a good living right? The workplaces are now without a worker. Our patients don't have, you know, the people in place to care for them. We didn't help anybody. So just getting a student past the test is not enough. We've got to get them prepared for the workplace as well. Now, if you remember, if you've listened to me at all, you know that I preach it's all about the care plan. The care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. You hear me say this. It's in all of my trainings. It's, I've got a video on it on my website. I, I talk about it all the time. And, and if you attend my class, you'll realize that the care plan is the one thing that you need to know more than anything else. Because that care plan is not just going to get you past the test. That care plan is what's telling you what to do in the workplace with Johnny. And Johnny's care plan is going to be way different than Bobby's. And Bobby's care plan is going to be completely different than Mary's because they're different people and they have different needs. And that's how if you if you tweak your program to make sure that the student understands from day one, day one, hour one that the care plan is going to be unique for every person and that care plan is going to tell us what to do with every person. And as a CNA, our job is to follow that care plan using the principles, the, the, the how. Um, in, uh, my training is all full of the how, right? That's what you see in the videos. If you watch my videos, you know there's puzzle pieces up at the top. Those are the principles. If we do the care plan using the principles and we adapt the skills for that particular patient because the care plan told us how, then when we get out of the workplace, we know exactly what to do. We know that patient is unique. They have a care plan. The care plan tells me what to do with that patient. The principles I learned in class tell me how to do it. It all goes together. It's seamless. So now... We have a program that meets the state's criteria, that gets the patient to pass the test. And when they get into workplace, they know what they're supposed to do. There's not that separation between the two. But in order to make that work, we've got to convince the teachers that we're not training many nurses, that we're training CNAs. 
and they need a little bit different approach to make all of that line up. So I hope that helped you. I hope that helped you. Um, but that is a that is a really, really, really good question. Some some why girl. <laughs> Uh, Katie says, so true. Thank you so much. Jennifer says, I waited a year to take mine. I agree. It's not a, your exam. You agree. It's not a good idea. And Marina says, is it best to take the skills test at your school if they allow it or at a location option of the tester? Oh, well, Marina, that's really up to you. Um, most schools, there's going to be a delay in testing because they have to wait until everybody is ready because they have to test so many people at one time. So schools, there's probably a delay. Um, a regional testing center, they test every single day, usually seven days a week. Um, so there's usually not much of a delay. You'll be able to test pretty quickly. So it's really kind of up to you. Um, Let's see. Hi, JK. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet. Susan. Okay, Susan, real quick. What is your last question? Because I got to go. <laughs> go ahead and type in your question, Susan. Amy says, Jennifer, did you test with Prometric? I didn't have fluid intake cups on my skills. Yes, um, Amy, that's a very good point. Prometric does not give you um, cups and have you uh, tell us how much fluid. It, that's not um, on a Prometric test. With food and fluid intake, you're going to be doing it as a percentage. In my book, uh, my the skills book, that one back there, I have a whole um, activity on that, on estimating food percentages. The only time that we actually measure fluid for Prometric is emptying the drainage bag. And then you've got that graduated, that triangle container that um, has the, the black markings on it and you round to the nearest line. Um, okay, yes, uh, final question. You're right, JK, <laughs> final question. Susan, do you, okay, there we go. Um, please, how can a CNA help an Alzheimer patient feel more independent who cannot find her room? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, hi, Gloria. Oh, thank you so much, Gloria. We love you from Dallas, Texas. That's awesome. Um, I was just in Houston in our college station, actually, in um, July uh, at a conference. Uh, Texas is um, great barbecue. OK, Susan, so how do you help an Alzheimer patient feel more independent who cannot find her room? So again, OK, I'm going to refer you back to the care plan for that particular patient. I can give you a couple strategies, but I don't know what is specific to that patient. You know, which one of these strategies would work for that particular patient? Because I don't know the patient. Right. But there's a couple of things that as a nurse, I would consider um, before um, putting it in the care plan. So one thing that um, I've seen done very successfully is a memory box right outside the room. So it would be like a big shadow box with a door on it. And you'd have maybe some pictures or some um, memorabilia that's very specific to them. Um, so it, it's a memory box outside of their room. Some places use... Um, the name of the patient in big letters, like uh, Sophia, let's say her, her name is Sophia. So Sophia would be on the door, but that assumes that the patient can still recognize their name. And in late stage Alzheimer's, you may not have that ability. Um, sometimes it, it can just be, um, and I've seen this happen too, where um, if you've got, Again, this is going to be very specific to the individual. But one thing that I've seen in the past is, you know, like the little doggy gates. So we had a, a patient who was um, ambulatory. She had one of the big walkers, um, the one that kind of went all the way around her. And she was nonverbal, late stage uh, or uh, mid to late stage Alzheimer's. And she would she would wander through the facility. It was a locked facility. But everybody at the end of the hallway, so everybody from her room back, they were all um, kind of bed bound, uh, more restricted to their room. We might have gotten them out of the bed in the chair, but they weren't ambulatory. OK, so they, they pretty much stayed 
um, you know, in their, their little section. So for her room, what we did is we took just one section of a little doggy gate and put it just past her doorway so that as she's coming down the hallway um, and she sees that gate, it kind of herds her into her room. And that was effective for that particular patient. But when you're, when you're talking about a patient, one patient, one specific person, it's hard for me to give you a, a solution because I don't know that person. So I would suggest that you talk to the nurse that's responsible for that patient's care and see if you can problem solve together. Um, maybe a picture on the door, maybe a memory box, maybe, um, you know, just problem solve and try to come up with something that's specific for that person. Another one we had um, had a coat rack, or like a little... Um, <laughs> like a, it wasn't even a coat rack. It was just something on the wall, like a little hook on the wall. And she had a pink sweater that she wore all the time that, you know, was hung up on her door frame. So she knew that was her room. So every single um, patient is going to be a little bit different. So you need to problem solve with the nurse for that patient to try to come up with the right solution for that patient. JK says in our memory care, the doors have specific colors for residents to know where they are. Also today in work, a goat and cat came in to see the residents. Awesome. Oh, that's incredible. A goat. That would be cool. That would be cool. Um, so yeah, colors might work. Absolutely. So like I said, just work with the nurse to try to find a specific um, opportunity there for that patient. Um Okay, Susan, I'm so sorry I'm running out of time. Um, if you get a chance, just uh, post your question and we'll get to it next week, okay? So we'll get to your question next week. And guys, I'm so sorry, but I got to run. Uh, real quick before we leave, um, these are the people that passed this week. Let me know that they passed. So we're going to say congratulations to Coco Love. Congratulations. Aisha Emanuel, great job. Way to go. Claudel Shute passed the CNA exam th this week. Congratulations. And Dahlia Sedino Reyes also became a CNA this week. So great job, guys. Keep up the, the good work. And if you are testing soon and you want to leave a comment on any one of my videos, make sure it's, it's a comment, not a response to somebody else, because I don't always see those. So make sure it's a comment on any one of my videos that comes to me. And let me know that you passed and we'll congratulate you on next week's live CNA question and answer session. Remember, we do this every week on Thursdays at three. Uh, make sure that you join us. If you like our channel, subscribe and ring that bell. So you got to like it. It's three steps. They, they keep adding steps. So like our channel, subscribe and then ring the bell. And YouTube will let you know when we go live. So you can join us on our future live sessions as well. So hope to see you guys again next Thursday at three. Until next time, happy caregiving.